Intellectual and Manual Labor, a Critique of Epistemology by Alfred Son Ruthel. Uh, this is the preface and the introduction. So, preface. This inquiry is concerned with the relationship between base and superstructure in the Marxian sense. This, to a large extent, leads into new territory. Marx and Engels have clarified the general architecture of history consisting of productive forces and production relations, which together form the material basis for consciousness as superstructure. But they have not left us a blueprint for the staircase that should lead from the base to the superstructure, and it is this with which we are concerned, or at least with its barest scaffolding of formal precision. To continue with our metaphor, the staircase must be given a firm anchorage in the basement, and this, for commodity-producing societies, can only be found in the formal analysis of commodity itself. This analysis, however, requires considerable enlargement and deepening before it can carry the full weight I intend to place on it. For Marx, it served to carry the critique of political economy. For us, it must carry, in addition, the critique of the, tra the traditional theories of science and cognition. What is new and bewildering in the present undertaking is that it must lay hand upon the commodity analysis as we have it from Marx, and thus upon that part of his theory commonly regarded as the untouchable foundation stone. It may therefore not be amiss to preface the theoretical presentation with a short sketch of thought biography to show how the deviating offshoot originated and has taken shape. Moreover, it may also be necessary to explain why the investigation has taken 50 years to mature before reaching the light of day. It began towards the end of the First World War and in its aftermath at a time when the German proletarian revolution should have occurred and tragically failed. This period led me into personal contact with Ernst Bloch, Walter Benjamin, Max Horkheimer, Siegfried Krakauer, and Theodore W. Adorno, and the writings of George Lucas and Herbert Marcuse. Strange though it may sound, I do not hesitate to say that the new development of Marxist thought which these people represent evolved as the, the, the theoretical and ideological superstructure of the revolution that never happened. In it, re-echo the thunder of the gun battle for the Marstall in Berlin at Christmas, 1918, and the shooting of the Spartacus Rising in the following winter. The paradoxical condition of this ideological movement may help to explain its almost exclusive preoccupation with superstructural questions, and the conspicuous lack of concern for the material and economic base that should have been underlying, underlying it. As far as I was concerned, though not a member of the Spartacus movement, I was stirred by the political events, partaking in the discussions at street corners and public meeting halls, lying under window sills while bullets pierced the windows, experiences which are traced in the pages to follow. My political awakening started in 1916 at the age of 17 and still at school when I began reading August Bebel and Marx. I was thrown out of home and was part of the beginning and was part of the beginning of the anti-war rebellion of students in my first university year at Heidelberg in 1917, with Ernst Toller as a leading figure. For us, the world could have fallen to pieces if only Marx remained intact. But then everything went wrong. The revolution moved forward and backward and finally ebbed away. Lenin's Russia receded further and further into the distance. At university, we learned that even in Marx, there were theoretical flaws, that marginal utility economics had rather more in its favor, and that Max Weber had successfully contrived sociological antidotes against the giant adversary Marx. But this teaching only made itself felt within the academic walls. Outside, there were livelier spirits about, among them my unforgettable friend Alfred Seidel, who in 1924 committed suicide. Here, outside the university, the end of the truth had not yet come. I glued myself to Marx and began in earnest to read Capital with a relentless determination to not let go. 
Lire le capital, as Louis Althusser says so rightly. It must have taken some two years when in the background of my university studies, I scribbled mountains of paper, seizing upon every one of the vital terms occurring in the first 60 pages of capital, turning them round and round for definitions, and above all for metaphorical significance, taking them to pieces and putting them together. Again. And what resulted from this exercise was the unshakable certainty of the penetrating truth of Marx's thinking, combined with an equally unshakable doubt about the theoretical consistency of the commodity analysis as it stood. There were more, there were more and other things in it than Marx had succeeded in, t in reaching. And finally, with an effort of concentration bordering on madness, it came upon me that in the innermost core of the commodity structure there was to be found the transcendental subject. Without need to say so, it was obvious to everybody that this was sheer lunacy, and no one was squeamish about telling me so. But I knew that I had grasped the beginning of a thread whose end was not yet in sight. But the secret identity of commodity form and thought form, which I had glimpsed, was so hidden within the bourgeois world that my first naive attempts to make others see it only had the result that I was given up as a hopeless case. Son Rethel is crazy, was the regretful and final verdict of my tutor, Alfred Weber, brother of Max, who had had a high opinion of me. In these circumstances, there was of course no hope of an academic career either, with the consequence that I remained an outsider all my life with my idée fix. Only a few isolated spirits, spirits, outsiders like myself, had kindred ideas in their minds, and none more sympathetically so than Adorno, who in his own manner was on the same track. We checked up on this together in 1936. He and his whole mental makeup was occupied with completely different matters rather than the analysis of commodity and economics. Therefore, even my contact with him was only partial, and I was thrown back on my own resources for unraveling my thread of truth. That this process was full of deadlocks and long periods of interruptions, both for reasons of money earning and because of other difficulties, goes without saying. The interruptions, periods of complete recession, add up to even longer durations than the periods of the theoretical work. The time between 1924 and 1927 was spent in Italy, mainly in Capri, where Benjamin and Bloch were staying then to Davos for an international university course where I met Heidegger, Ernst Kasserer, Alexander Quare, and others, but had to remain for two and a half years for a cure of tuberculosis. When I returned to Germany to face the slump with absolutely no financial resources, I was lucky to find work in an office of big business in Berlin. There I was also engaged in illegal anti-Nazi activities escaping from arrest by the Gestapo to reach England in 1937. In, Bir in Birmingham, I met Professor George Thompson, the only other man I have known who had also recognized the interconnection of philosophy and money, although in a completely different field from my own. In ancient Greece, I finally finished a long manuscript Intellectual and Manual Labor in 1951, which despite strenuous efforts by Thompson and Bernal, was turned down by the publishers Lawrence and Weishart as being too unorthodox for them, and by bourgeois publishers as being too militantly Marxist. Until 1970, only three small texts of mine were published. Since 1970, several, several of my books have appeared in Germany as a result of which I was appointed guest professor at the University of Bremen from 1972 to 1976. For the present English version of this book, I am particularly indebted to Dr. Wilfried Vanderwill for reading my script and for his unstinting advice and critical comment, also to my son Martin for his work as translator, and to the late Sigurd Zinho for stimulating discussions during many years of friendship. My inextinguishable gratitude is due to Joan, my wife, for her untiring effort and unflagging devotion to my work, which has become ours in common. 
Introduction Our epoch is widely regarded as the age of science. Indeed, science, and especially scientific technology, exerts an influence upon production and through production upon the economics and the class relations of society. The effects of this have, have thrown into disarray the historical expectations and conceptions of people convinced of the need for socialism. We are no longer sure of our most trusted ideas of scientific socialism or of our theoretical image of capitalism. How is the progressive destruction of money through inflation in accord with the labor law of value? Are the profits of multinational corporations in, key, in keeping with the mechanics of surplus value? What are the social implications and economic, economics of a technology which tends to absorb the work of human labor? Does this technology widen or narrow the gulf between mental and manual labor? Does it help or hinder socialist revolution? How does the profit and loss account on the balance sheets of capital relate to the balance between man and nature? Is modern technology class neutral? Is modern science class biased? Has Marxist analysis kept up with the changes of society we have witnessed since the two world wars? Our insights must reach sufficiently deep to enable us to understand our modern world in Marxist terms and guide our revolutionary practice. Historical materialism was conceived by Marx as the method of the scientific understanding of history. No other position can offer an alternative. The present study has been undertaken in the belief that an extension to Marx's theory is needed for a fuller understanding of our own epoch. Far from moving away from Marxism, this should lead deeper into it. The reason why many essential questions of today cause such difficulties is that our thinking is not Marxist enough. It leaves important areas unexplored. We understand our epoch is that in which the transition from capitalism to socialism and the building of a socialist society are the order of the day. In contrast, Marx's epoch was engaged in the capitalist process of development. Its theoretical perspective was limited to the trends pushing this development to its limits. It is clear that this change of historical scenery shifts the Marxist field of vision in a significant way. The transition from capitalism to socialism means, according to Marx, the ending of prehistory, the transition from the uncontrolled to the fully conscious development of mankind. To understand society in its final capitalist phase, one needs a precise insight into the causality and interrelationships between the growth of the material productive forces and the social relations of production. Marx's capital certainly contains countless references to the mental superstructure determined by the social basis and also to the indispensable intellectual foundations of production. But the problem of the formation of consciousness is not the primary concern of Marx's main work. In our epoch, however, it has assumed crucial importance. We speak of these intellectual foundations because a historical materialist insight into present day technology and its scientific basis is essential for the possibility of a consciously organized society. In fact, Marx did not focus his attention on a historical materialist understanding of natural science. In the famous methodological guidelines of 1859, science is not mentioned as part of the mental superstructure but it should indeed provide the guideline for a standpoint of thinking, which is itself scientific. Marx saw his own viewpoint as historically conditioned and as anchored in the labor theory of value. It is scientific because it corresponds to the standpoint of the proletariat. But natural science was not given a place as either belonging to the ideological superstructure or the social base. The references to science and capital appear to take their intrinsic methodological possibilities for granted. The historical materialist omission of this inquiry into the conceptual foundation of science has led to a schism of thought within the contemporary Marxist camp. On the one hand, all phenomena contained in the world of consciousness, whether past, present, or future, are understood historically as time-bound and dial dialectic. On the other hand, questions of logic, mathematics, and science are seen as ruled by timeless standards. Is a Marxist thus a materialist as far as historical truth is concerned, but an idealist when confronted by the truth of nature? Is his thought split between two concepts of truth, the one dialectical and time-bound, the other undialectical, 
consigning any awareness of historical time to oblivion. That Marx's own thinking was not rent by any such incompatibilities goes without saying. Extensive proof is found in his early writings and in the Communist Manifesto. Particularly illuminating are the references to the sciences and the economic and philosophic man manuscripts of 1844, which prove that in his historical materialist conception, the sciences were originally included. The relevant evidence and arguments are contained in Alfred Schmidt's outstanding study, The Concept of Nature and the Theory of Marx. Even in the foreword of the first edition of Capital, Marx calls the evolution of the economic formation a process of natural history, and he explains that his own method of approach is calculated to bring out the truth of this statement. But he did not clarify the issue sufficiently to prevent the thought of his successors and followers splitting into two contradictory concepts of truth. Whether the split is overcome or not is vital for the modern theory and practice of socialism. The creation of socialism demands that society makes modern developments of, technology, of science and technology subservient to its needs. If, on the other hand, science and technology elude historical materialist understanding, mankind might go, not the way of socialism, but that of technocracy. Society would not rule over technology, but technology over society. And this not only applies to the Western world where technocratic thought is based on positivism, it is no less true of some socialist countries which revere technocracy in the name of dialectical materialism. Thus, a historical materialist explanation of the origins of scientific thought and its development is one of the areas by which Marx's theory should be extended. There is furthermore a lack of theory, a, there is furthermore a lack of a theory of intellectual and manual labor, of their historical division and the conditions for their possible reunification. In the critique of the Gotha program, Marx makes reference to this antithesis that a higher phase of communist society becomes possible only after the enslaving subordination of individuals under division of labor. And therewith also the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished. But before understanding how this antithesis can be removed, it is necessary to understand why it arose in the first place. Clearly, the division between the labor of head and hand stretches in one form or another throughout the whole history of class society and economic exploitation. It is one of the phenomena of alienation on which exploitation feeds. Nevertheless, it is by no means self-apparent how a ruling class invariably has at its command the specific form of mental labor which it requires. And although by its roots it is obviously bound up with the conditions underlying the class rule, the mental labor of a particular epoch does require certain independence to be of use to the ruling class. Nor are the bearers of the mental labor, be they priests, philosophers, or scientists, the main beneficiaries of the rule to which they contribute. They remain its servants. The objective value of their function, and even the standard of truth itself, emerge in history in the course of the division of head and hand, which in its turn is part of the class rule. Thus, objective truth and its class function are connected at their very roots, and it is only if they can be seen thus linked, logically and historically, that they can be explained. But what implications does this have for the possibility of a modern, classless, and yet highly technological society? This question leads on to the need for a further extension of Marx's theory, which did not arise at an earlier epoch. What is in fact the effective line of differentiation between a class society and a classless one? They are both forms of social production relations, but this general concept does not convey the difference on which, the de on which depends the transition from capitalism to socialism and the varying shades of socialism. What is needed is a specific and unambigu unambiguous criterion of social structure, not of ideology, by which a classless society should be recognizable as essentially different from all class societies. The three groups of questions raised here stand in an inner relationship to each other. The link connecting them is the social synthesis, the network of relations by which society forms a coherent whole. It is around this notion that the major arguments of this book will revolve. As social forms develop and change, 
so also does the, syn the synthesis, which holds together the multiplicity of links operating between men according to the division of labor. Every society made up of a plurality of individuals is a network coming into effect through their actions. How they act is of primary importance for the social network. What they think is of secondary importance. Their activities must interrelate in order to fit into a society and must contain at least a minimum of uniformity if the society is to function as a whole. This coherence can be conscious or unconscious, but exist it must. Otherwise, society would cease to be viable and the individuals would come to grief as a result of their multiple dependencies upon one another. Expressed in very general terms, this is a precondition for the survival of every kind of society. It formulates what I term social synthesis. This notion is thus nothing other than a constituent part of the Marxian concept of social formation, a part which, in the course of my long preoccupation with historical forms of thinking, has become indispensable to my understanding of man's social condition. From this observation, I derive the general epistemological prop proposition that the socially necessary forms of thinking of an epoch are those in conformity with the socially synthetic functions of that epoch. It will, I think, help the reader's comprehension if the somewhat intricate investiga investigation contained in this book if I give a broad outline of the underlying conception. It is not the consciousness of men that determine their being, but on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. This statement of Marx is not meant as the pronouncement of an intrinsic truth, but is part of the uh, Prissy of general methodological tenets, characters, characteristic of the materialist conception of history given in the preface of 1859. This Prissy indicates how the determination of men's consciousness by their social being can be established in any particular instance. My investigation is in strict keeping with the Marxian outline. But, while in that outline, the reference is to the legal, political, religious, aesthetic, or philosophical, in short, ideological forms, in which men become conscious of their social conflicts and fight them out. My preoccupation is with the conceptual foundations of the cognitive faculty vis-a-vis -vis nature, which in one form or another is characteristic of the ages of commodity production, from their beginnings in ancient Greece to the present day. It is for this purpose that I deem it useful to interpret the Marxian concept of social being in accordance with my notion of the social syn synthesis. This will depend, of course, on how it justifies itself as a methodologically fruitful concept. In societies based on commodity production, the, so the social synthesis is centered on the functions of money as the universal equivalent to use Marx's expression. In this capacity, money must be vested with an abstractness of the highest level to enable it to serve as the equivalent to every kind of commodity that may appear on the market. This abstractness of money does not appear as such and cannot be expected to appear as it consists of nothing but form, pure abstract form arising from the disregard of the use value of the commodities operated by the act of exchange equating the commodities as values. That which constitutes the appearance of money is its material, its shape and size, and the symbols stamped on it. In short, all that makes money into a thing that can be carried about, spent, and received. But that which makes this thing money is the sense of value and of equivalence. In the sense of value and of equivalence is of a quality radically different from all the properties that can be seen or felt or counted or otherwise perceived. The human labor that has gone into the production of the things serving as money and into the commodities it serves to exchange determines the magnitude of their value, the proportion in which they are exchanged. But to be labor products is not a property which accrues to the commodities and to money in the relationship of exchange where the abstraction arises. The abstraction does not spring from labor but from exchange as a particular mode of social interrelationship. And it is through exchange that the abstraction imparts itself to labor, making it abstract human labor. 
The money abstraction can be more properly termed the exchange abstraction. The peculiar thesis then argued on the following pages is to the effect that one commodity exchange owes its socially synthetic function to an abstraction which it originates, two that this abstraction is not of one piece but is a composite of several elements, three that these elementary parts of the abstraction can be separately defined, and four that if this is done in sufficient detail these constituent elements of the exchange abstraction unmistakably resemble the conceptual elements of the cognitive faculty emerging with the growth of commodity production. As conceptual elements, these forms are principles of thought, basic to Greek philosophy as well as to modern natural science. In this intellectual capacity, they can be labeled by the convenient Kantian term of categories a priori, especially as this can all the more drastically contrast our materialist account of the categories with the idealistic one of Kant. Additional argumentation will attempt to show that not only analogy, but true identity exists between the formal elements of the social synthesis and the formal constituents of cognition. We should then be entitled to state that the conceptual basis of cognition is logically and historically conditioned by the basic formation of the social synthesis of its epoch. Our explanation thus argues that the categories are historical by origin and social by nature, for they themselves affect the social synthesis on the basis of commodity production in such a way that the cognitive faculty that articulate they articulate is an a priori social capacity of the mind, although it bears the exactly contrary appearance, that of obeying the principle of ego cogito. Kant was right in his belief that the basic constituents of our form of cognition are performed in issue from a prior origin, but he was wrong in attributing this perf performation to the mind itself engaged in the phantas phantasmagorical performance of transcendental synthesis a priori, locatable neither in time nor in place. In a purely formal way, Kant's transcendental subject shows features of striking likeness to the exchange abstraction in its distillation as money. First of all, in its originally synthetic character, but also in its unique oneness. For the multiplicity of existing currencies cannot undo the essential oneness of their monetary function. There can be little doubt then that the historical materialist explanation adopted here satisfies the formal ex exigencies of a theory of cognition. It accounts for the historical emergence of the clear-cut division of intellectual and manual labor associated with commodity production. And by accounting for its genesis, it should also help us in perceiving the preconditions of its historical disappearance and hence of socialism as the road to a classless society. As for Kant's idealistic construction and that of his followers, it becomes clear that they serve to present the division of head and hand as a transcendental necessity. If this thesis can be argued convincingly, it would, dis it would dispose of the age-old idea that abstraction is the exclusive privilege of thought. The mind would no longer be enshrined in its own imminence. It would give room for a completely different appreciation of science and of mental labor, generally laying all intellectual activity open for an understanding of it in terms of the social formation of its epoch and critically evaluating its conceptual structure as well as its functional application in the light of the pertinent social conspectus. It is clear, on the other hand, that a thesis of this nature cannot draw on factual evidence for its verification, but must rely primarily on arguments of reason. So also does the Marxian theory of value and of surplus value. The facts of history tell in its favor only when viewed in the light of the categories established by the Marxian analysis of the conditions that endow them with the historical reality of valid facts. Our theory is directly concerned only with questions of form, form of consciousness and form of social being, attempting to find their inner connection, a connection which in turn affects our understanding of human history. The pivot of the argument lies with the structural form of social being, or more precisely, 
with the formal characteristics attaching to commodity production and to the social synthesis arising from it. Thus, the Marxian critique of political economy and our critique of bourgeois epistemology are linked by sharing the same methodological foundation. The analysis of the commodity in the opening chapters of Capital and prior to it in the, con in the contribution to the critique of political economy of 1859. And the salient point of the argument is that this link is one of formal identity. Nevertheless, the difference in scope implies differences in the procedure of the analysis which amount to more than mere shifts of emphasis. Marx was the first to discover the commodity abstraction at the root of the economic category of value, and he analyzed it from the twofold viewpoint of form and of magnitude. The exchange process gives to the commodity, which it transforms to money, not its value, but its specific form of value. He states in the chapter on exchange, The form and the magnitude of value springs from different sources, the one from exchange, the other from labor. The critique of political economy hinges upon the understanding of how they combine to become the abstract human labor, constituting at once the form and the substance of value. Thus, the commodity abstraction, or as we would say, the exchange abstraction is interpreted by Marx foremost as being the value abstraction, without involving the need to explore in any detail the source from which the abstraction springs. This is in perfect keeping with Marx's purpose of a critique of political economy. For our purpose, however, we must concentrate in the first place on the formal aspect of value, not only in preference to, but even in separation from its economic content of labor. Or, to put it differently, we have to proceed from the commodity abstraction to the source from where the abstraction emanates and must carry through a painstakingly accurate and detailed analysis of the formal structure of exchange as the basis of its socially synthetic function. Thus, notwithstanding their common methodological foundation, the critique of political economy and the critique of philosophical epistemology have to pursue their tasks in complete independence of each other, in strict accordance, that is, with the diverse systematic nature of their subject matters. The fields of economics and of nature, natural science have not a term in common, and it would be a hopeless endeavor to try to cope with the critique of epistemology by grafting it on to the Marxian critique of political economy. It must be undertaken as an investigation standing on its own ground to be judged by its own standards. This does not prevent both these critical pursuits from being inseparably bound up with each other in the results that yield, or they yield, for our understanding of history. The class antagonisms which commodity production engenders in all its stages, in Marxist terms, the ancient classical, the feudal, and the modern bourgeois modes of production, are intrinsically connected with closely corresponding forms of division of head and hand, but how this connection operates will become recognizable only when the form analysis of the exchange abstraction has been accomplished.